Um, we honor and respect the diverse indigenous peoples connected to this place where we gather. And also thank you to our sponsors, which include the Greater Columbus Arts Council, the Ohio Arts Council, White Castle, UBS. They're awesome. They're why we're here for free today. <laughs> so I'm super excited to be here with Mari, no no Mari Nomi, excuse me. <laughs> um, who is just such a prolific artist, so many books, so many zines, so many things that I wanna talk about today, including their newest book, I Thought You Loved Me, which as we kind of started in on is currently being um, published by Field Mouse Press. Alex is in the room, so Woo, um, go visit the Field Mouse Press table and also make sure that you donate to that campaign so we can see this book in print. We have perks. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> and it's a very, very beautiful book. So There's um, actually a book up there um, on the table. It's the only one in existence right now. Um, so you could actually leaf through it if you want to see it. Yes, you can see. Please don't steal it. It's mine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And I'm Rachel Miller. Um, I study comics. I write about comics. And I help put together CXC sometimes. So here we are. <laughs> and I'm happy you all are here. So Yay, you. Yay, Yay. Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going <laughs> to... Thanks. Um, I'm going to ask Mari a couple questions and have a little conversation. And then I'll open it up to you all. So... We can all talk. Um, but yeah, so, oh, let's give a hand to Mari. Oh, that's not, that's, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I wanted to start off with your zines and your mini comics, because that's what I'm obsessed with, is zines <laughs> and minis. And I just, I'm interested in what got you into self-publishing and what got you into zine making. Well, let's see. Um, when I was growing up, I wanted to be a novelist. Um, and I, I think even before I knew how to write, I just wanted to be a novelist. I think that might have been because of the unrealistic ways per, uh, novelists were portrayed in media. Um, Murder, She Wrote seems like a perfect life to me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, also my dad wants to be a writer, so that was, probably had something to do with it. And so that, that was just always my goal. I loved words, I loved reading, I loved writing. There was a time, I, so I wrote a couple of really terrible novels in my um, when I was 18 and I think 21. And I tried to get them published and I realized that I wanted to have nothing to do with the publishing world. Like it didn't occur to me that writing also involved that kind of work. And so I was like, well, I don't want to do that anymore. And that's around the time that I started working in video games. And at the same time that I quit novels, I discovered that I loved comics when I read um, Twisted Sisters, which was edited by Diane Newman, who recently passed away. Um, and it was specifically Mary Fleener's comic, The Jelly, which was about her hot mess of a roommate. Um, that made me think, I have hot mess roommate stories. <laughs> um, I could draw, like this seems really fun. And it had never occurred to me to tell my own stories before that um, because like memoirs weren't really a thing unless you were like a celebrity. So telling average everyday stories of like just like your punk rock shit. I mean, sorry, can I swear here? Oh yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> so like I, you know, I was pretty adventurous, and I, I still am pretty adventurous, even though I'm getting older and I don't go to after parties because I'm tired. But like I still tr like to try new things. I get bored if there's not enough change in my life, um, and this is partly why each book I put out is completely different <laughs> than the last, because um, I'm just always wanting to try new things. So, so I have a lot of stories and I'm like, well, I can make comics. And so it was February 1997 where, when I sat down to write my first comic and March, I think 3rd, 1997, when I finished it. And I think it was like 10 pages, seven or 10 pages. And I'm like, now I'm a cartoonist. And so now I want to get it published in um, Action Girl uh, Comics which was this, I think it was Fanta, no, Slave Labor Graphics. Um, they published my first comic. It wasn't the first comic I made, but the, the first comic I got published. And um, as I was waiting for that to happen, I, I think I was working at Sega at the time, and I'm like, oh, well, I have enough comics now. I could make a little zine and go to the comic conventions, because that's actually where I met uh, Sarah Dyer from Action Girl Comics. Okay. And so, um, actually, no, it was her publisher. Anyway. It all happened from going to the Alternative Press Expo in San Jose in 1998, and that's how I got published. Um, and yeah, and I just started making my own zines. Um, and that, yeah, that's how it started. 
That's awesome. Um, I didn't really expect it to turn into a thing, though, because it was like, this is a fun thing that I'm doing. Like I would public, like I would print up like 25 each of my zine at first, and then like by the time you got to that other comic that you had up there, the Estras, I think I, you know, I think I sold more than 500 of those, which is insane oh, wow. because each comic had so many personalized details in there. Like there was a page in there that had like me making out with this like guy with a rainbow mohawk, and like it had like each string of rainbow mohawk had um a different coat oh, i think oh, i have the page yeah, well, so this the, one is the making out yes. like that and the rainbow and also the rainbow in the, the fourth panel actually yeah every mohawk picture every panel except for the third panel ha i was painting in with gel pens like different colors so i had like i think 10 different gel pens i was using on on just this page because of the the thickness of the, uh, sorry, it's boring. But anyway. No, it's, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I love hearing about this. I love gel pens too. <laughs> like some of them were too, like I, I wouldn't, they wouldn't see in the lines. I had to find the perfect gel pen. So even though there was an orange color on his hair and also in the rainbow, like I, it wasn't the same pen because I couldn't use it for both. So anyway, I just had just hundreds of these laid out and like I would, I would make them to order, which I still do. Um, like, at, you know, every time I'd have a, tabling thing, thing or if someone order, would order my zine, I would just make them to order. And so like I was constantly just filling in the, the mohawk, which was, wow, so much work. But like- So you were hand coloring every in the single one, mini yeah. comic. Yeah. Wow. Every <laughs> single one. And it was more than 500 copies. And this was the first time that I feel like the industry even noticed me. Um, Cause yeah, I, I'd finally gotten like a good story or something. So it was, it was uh, but yeah, I'm like, wow, if I'd known <laughs> that people would order so many of these, I wouldn't maybe have made them so time intensive, um, <laughs> labor intensive, but but like, yeah, I still did it because I'm crazy. <laughs> what do you think it was about that story that people took notice of? I don't know if it was that story in particular. Um, I think honestly, the, this was around the time when I finally found my voice. Mm -hmm. Like, and I wasn't doing it very consistently consistently before this. So this was probably 2003, 2004. Um, and up to that point, like I'd been making comics and they'd all had kind of a theme about um, relationships or feminism or whatever, like queerness, um, just bisexuality in specific. Um, I, yeah, for the longest time, I'm like, well, maybe I'll do something longer someday. And it, and it kind of came to me one day, and I think it's 2002, 2003. I'm like, I want to write about my love life, like specifically, even though I kind of had been up to that point, but I kind of finally had a book idea. And so I started doing it in zine form as I was like, you know, trying to figure out, well, how am I going to do this thing? Um, and it eventually turned into Kiss and Tell, which got published by Harper Perennial. But like, that's, that's another long story. Um, we have the cover there. Yeah, but like up to that point, I'm just like, yeah, a little here, a little there. And I'm like, oh, I want to tell this bigger story, which, you know, I didn't realize I was about to change my life. Um, so beware. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you think that writing these personal stories about your romantic life and doing that in a zine form, do you think that that process was different than if you had like been working with a publisher at the time? Was putting it out yourself, like what was different about that or what did that afford you that maybe you wouldn't have done working I mean, with a publisher? I don't know, because I never, like, when I got the publisher, I mean, we were looking for, me and my last agent, my first agent, we were looking for a publisher. Um, like a lot of people interviewed me um, or we had meetings where we were trying to see if it was a good fit or not. A lot of them, like the, the material was too mature or like it wasn't quite on their wheelhouse or whatever. Um, um, like by the time we found a publisher, I'd had, I had quite a lot of pages um, done. And when Harper Perennial and Jeanette Perez uh, was my editor, she found this book and then we decided to work together. She was like, okay, well, this is great let's put in some other stuff that has no relation to the relationship. Like, let's talk about your parents. Let's talk about mm -hmm. your friendships. And it was funny because like when I was kind of workshopping it in like writers groups and stuff, 
whenever I try to get outside of that boundary, everyone's like, oh, no, 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 that doesn't fit in with a theme. So mm -hmm. people were telling me not to do that. And um, yeah, so when I got an editor, she's like, well, let's, let's, let's round this out and, mm -hmm. and make it you know, about you instead of just about this one thing. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, and so if I'd been working with her from the be beginning, like maybe I could have had the foresight, but it was because of the format of this book, which is like bite-sized stories, it was really easy for me to put other bite-sized stories in, so that wasn't really an issue. Um, and I really like how it turned out. Like, this is my funniest book by far. Yeah, it's fantastic. And you saying that, like, what the editor yeah. was adding in terms of, like, oh, write about your friendships or write about your parents, write about, like, you even, you write about, like, your experiences with um, drugs and going out and stuff like that. Um, something I really love about your work is how, deeply you delve into those other aspects of life. It's not just about like the romantic relationships. Thank or... you, Jeanette Perez. Well, she's <laughs> yeah. a really good editor. <laughs> yeah. Thank you to her. And I'm, so I'm just kind of curious because, um, you know, at this point in my life, I kind of, I'm like, oh, like my friendships are kind of like romances too. You oh know? my God, absolutely. Like, and how do you decide like, what you want to disclose about those relationships or because <laughs> <laughs> I would one. struggle with that if I was you know writing about well here's the thing when she wanted me to put these other things in I mean it's already kind of nerve-wracking to write about these things um, especially when you realize that more than like 25 of your friends are going to read it um, like it's, it, it got kind of scary, honestly. Mm. And when she wanted me to write about my parents, like, so the book is dedicated to my mom and dad, who I hope will never read this, is what it says <laughs> in the beginning. And um, like, that was really scary. And so when she wanted me to write more about them, I'm like, oh no, like we have such a good relationship now, but we absolutely didn't when I was a teenage runaway for some reason, like doing all the drugs for some reason. and. Um, so it was, yeah, I was really scared, and um, I was actually we were talking earlier, and I was like, I was talking about a Jeanette McCurdy um, interview with Drew Barrymore, where she said, "Write as if everyone you know is dead," and um, that's really. She says she didn't invent the, that that saying, but like it's a really good saying. Um, also, that her book is amazing, which is "I Wish My Mom Was Dead." I just I listened to it on the plane ride here. <laughs> so fucking good. Um, it's really funny. Um, and traumatic, <clears throat> as the best things are. What was the question? <laughs> oh, no, I mean, I, I guess I'm just interested in like, how how do you pick and choose what stories to tell? Oh. Um, and is there like... I feel like my, you know, over time, like that has changed because I've had a lot of trials and errors where I've accidentally hurt people's feelings. Um, and, or like I wrote too much or I could have written more, like, Here's the thing, like even when you ask people's permission to write about them, which I did not, um, I, I, I don't generally do that. I usually write about it and then show it to them before it gets published. If, if I want to have a good relationship with them going forward, um, I didn't always do that. I definitely probably pushed some boundaries that I shouldn't have in certain stories that I've since taken off the market. I mean, just just from, you know, you learn these things. But the thing is, there's really no right answer about how to do that. Um, I've definitely had people say, don't write about this, um, or I want you to write about this, and then when you do, they get mad at you later because they changed their mind. Yeah. Um, and, and it's perfectly their right to change their mind, but yeah, it makes you feel like shit later. Um, I once told a story about an ex, and he and I were quote unquote friends at the t later, and then he saw the comic, and he was very upset about the comic, and really I was telling his story, so he had a right to be upset about that story. And I don't talk about Dot Tim anymore, which actually is a good thing in my life. Um, but also, I'm like, oh, that's a good thing going forward. Like, just tell my own secrets and not other people's secrets. And if mm. other people's secrets are involved, and I want, them to know about it or I don't want to get an angry email out of the blue or phone call then like maybe I should show it to them or let them know it's happening um, and just give them time to process it instead of coming across it on Instagram or something. Actually my best friend came came across my non-binary status on Instagram <laughs> recently and and she was pretty mad she was like I'm you know I'm her I didn't you never talked about this to me before I'm like mm -hmm. 
really? I talk about it on Twitter all the time. She's like, I'm not on Twitter. <laughs> I'm like, I thought you knew. <laughs> I also have that bad habit. Oh I'm like, God. well, I talked about this on Twitter, so like, you should know. <laughs> Very few of my in real life friends are on Twitter. Yeah. Although my dad's on Twitter, so. My dad did friend request me on Twitter recently because mine's private, and oh, I was right. like, oh no. <laughs> I'm sorry, Dad. He got mad at me for something I taught once, and that was a bummer. But like, I think most, for the most part, we're good. <laughs> Um, oh yeah, so so back to what I do and don't write about. Like it's really tricky because I know going into it that even if they say they're fine, they're not. They might not be, and even mm -hmm. if they aren't fine, they will be. Like like I I did a book called um, after this book came out, uh, Dragon's Breath and Other True Stories, where I talked about my alcoholic grandfather, mm -hmm. and. I, you know, throughout the process of talking about it, because this, this was stuff I was doing as web comics before it turned into a book, and I did want to be careful with my parents because it was also their story. I put it, I, I showed them it, it seemed like it was fine, and then the book came out years later, and they were not fine. And um, I can't remember which of my parents were like, this is too personal, I can't believe you put this here. And of course I felt terrible, but then later on, like years later again, my mom sent me the nicest email she's ever sent me saying, I just reread your book and wow, like it's really powerful how mm -hmm. you portrayed grandpa as a dragon and this is really good. And I'm like, and that's sitting in my inbox even though it's like from 2016. I'm like, this is the best thing my mom's ever said to me. But like, <laughs> it was a process getting there and that wasn't my process like I don't know what changed her mind about it or mm -hmm. you know whatever happened but like it's complicated yeah. yeah and so when I'm when I'm writing the story I just have to go for my gut and say you know what do I want to tell and then worry about what how people are going to take it as I'm in the editing process or before it gets published like I just can't think about it because like even if I put all my en energy into it, there's no way I can actually know. So it's just like spinning for the sake of spinning. It's borrowing trouble, as my friend likes to say. I like that. It's Yeah, it's so interesting because I think it, like this process that you're talking about kind of shows how even if we all experience, like we all have the same exact experience, it's like we all see it and experience it differently. Yeah. Um, I think maybe sometimes that could be what people are responding to. Like, oh, I didn't remember it this way. Or, oh, every time yeah. I write a story, every time, <laughs> even if it's like a very complimentary story or a terrible story, like the people in it are like, I, you know, that's not how I remember it. I'm like, please write your story. Like I, I want, like, I want all of us to, to write yeah. our stories and so that people can like read them all and take them all in and, and decide for themselves you know, what the reality was, like, cause that's super fun. Right. And that's actually what I did with my Losing the Girls story, like at my um, young adult trilogy, it's fiction, but I was playing around with the idea of like how people perceive themselves and, um, and, and situations. I mean, it's, I heard that there's a movie Rashomon that does the same thing and that's kind of the same idea in this, in this story. Yeah, cause in these books, um, the chapters are kind of divided up into each character's perceptions, and you have different ways of drawing um, those perceptions. These are just two examples of two different characters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, for that, how did you find that visual voice for each character? I was practicing. Um, there was a period of time where I was going on the internet and I drew the same page in several different formats, and like, okay, which one seems the most um, like unstable to you or you know whatever like I, I was I was really just doing a lot of trial and error um, the one on the left is An Emily Hiroko Baker and um, as she starts out completely in black and white but as she gains a little um, perspective her, her I add grays um, but not in like a grayscale shading sort of way and sort of a like plop grays um, so it's, it's very intentional as far as like how um, like what, I, what I'm tr trying to do with her inner dialogue. And um, as, as they develop more, sometimes I add color. Um, and the one on the right is her friend, Paula Navarro, um, who is actually based off of the person that I wrote about in I Thought You Loved Me. 
um, but I wasn't ready to write about it yet in memoir form. So this was me fictionalizing it and trying to figure it out for myself. Mm. Um, but yeah, so it was all like Paula is like a little more disjointed. So I just had kind of I didn't give her panels. I just like she's kind of a free spirit, but also just really in her head. So she's got a lot of like internal dialogue. Um, Emily has a little, but she's a lot more black and white. Like she's she's um, a little more outwardly seeming stable, but like she's, I mean, not, no teenager is. Right. Um, Maybe she kind of seems to think that she. Yes, yes. Like, and you get those like really vibrant, like spot blacks and, <laughs> and <laughs> but like her world is kind of constantly shifting and changing. Yeah, her. yeah. And then the more chaos in her world, the more chaotic her drawings are like 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 if she looks in the mirror and she's feeling like hot shit she looks really super cute in the mirror mm -hmm. and then another scene she's like feeling really insecure and she's talking to her crush at a party and she feels like a total dork and so i draw her like looking like a total dork i mean so it's really about their own perception mm. it was it was a little experimental i love the moments um for emily where like when she gets upset and she becomes this like like her face gets all monstrous <laughs> like it like jumps out into like this yeah like monster face I'm like oh I mean a lot of that you could see in like the like cartoons that I grew up with you know like like Bugs Bunny or whatever like they totally yeah. do that in those ca cartoons so like I didn't I didn't make that up but I, <laughs> I definitely stole it <laughs> I love it and okay so um, I do want to talk about the new book. Um, which visually is really a lot different <laughs> than other books. You can see the <laughs> the outfit and the cover. <laughs> um, so this book is so fascinating to me because you're um, using all these kind of different visual registers from like collage. Um, you change up the fonts. Some things are handwritten. It feels very like zine like um, yes, in a lot of ways. Absolutely. But a nice color zine <laughs> um, as opposed to like a Xerox zine. So I, I'm just really interested in hearing about your process putting together this book. I thought you loved me. This was such a different experience than any of my other books. Although, as I said, every one of my books is a completely different process. So that's just, that's just what I like to do, I guess. Um, generally, when I'm writing memoir, I like to do it from a place of very, um, like just a far away place, like of, mm -hmm. so I have more perspective. And then generally when people talk about memoir, that's why what I just, you know, I advise to do, like don't do it in the moment, um, do it when you know what the story is. And with this book, I absolutely did not know what the story was. I was going for catharsis. I didn't necessarily think that it would turn into a book that other people would necessarily see, um, but I thought I knew it was a possibility, so I tried to keep things like I changed people's names and stuff like that. Um, but my process started with a corkboard and um, post-its, which you see a lot of in this book, where I was like trying to I was trying to piece together our relationship. Um, I couldn't remember most of the years that she and I were friends. So this story is about a complicated queer friendship, um, which was mostly platonic, um, where basically one day she ghosted me. Um, and we were friends from age 14 to I think 28, really formative years. And then just one day she disappeared. And then six months later, she gave me a weird reason for disappearing, but like we weren't friends anymore. And um, so, yeah, we were best friends, and then they were not friends. And then, like, 10 years later, I found out what actually happened. Mm -hmm. And then 10 years or so after that, I decided, okay, I'm ready to, like, move on. Um, why is this still sticking with me? I am in my 40s. Why am I still stuck on this person who's probably not even the same person anymore? Like, I just, I just need to move on and forgive her. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to write this book. I'm gonna, you know, sit down and write about it. I'm gonna catharsis this away, and I'm gonna, I'm just gonna like put her behind me, put my trust issues behind me, like, you know, just go. And I found out that I couldn't remember anything about her other than the things that had broken us up, and like a couple weird stories here and there. But like, I'm like, we spent every day together practically, you know, for many years, like, what were we even doing? Like, mm -hmm. I, and I couldn't remember. So I go into my journals and I found every single instance where she appeared, 
I go into my agendas. I save everything, as you can see in this photo. <laughs> my calendars, my agendas. I'm like, well, how many days did we hang out? When was she with me? Like, what did we do? And I started documenting them on paper, and then I started typing them out with a typewriter onto Post-its and then putting them on a corkboard and trying to figure out the chronology of our friendship. So I was being very scientific about it, but also a little crazy. Um, and I say that in a good way. <laughs> um, a little OCD. Uh, and just, just trying to like jog my memory, honestly. And it was really just weird because I just, I, I, in the process, I realized that, of course, like I forgot a lot of other things, not just about her, but like there are entire humans who were important to me at one time in my life that I just completely wiped out. I don't know mm -hmm. if I wiped it out when I wiped her out or mm -hmm. what, but like this one guy, Chris Smith, kept, keeps appearing in the book and I'm just, or in, in my journals. And every time I talk about him, like I have all these exclamation parts. I'm like, oh, I saw Chris Smith at, at, at a party. I'm like, was he a crush? Was, was he a she? Was, you know, who, who is this person? Why did I like them? This is such a, like, I'm like, I re recognize the name, but it's also kind of generic. And so all these other mysteries popped up while I was trying to solve the mystery of like, well, what was our relationship actually like? You know, how did I miss these red flags that she is who she is when I thought she was something else? Mm. Like, and it turned into kind of like a detective thing where I'm just like, just trying to figure out what happened. Um, and there are some twists and turns because this is told in real time where I discover things that are pretty, pretty shocking, honestly, that, um, and I do figure out who Chris Smith is. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, it was, I don't know, it was just, it was weird. But yeah, it started out with, um, with post-its. But there, this, this grass you see, um, I think visually I started, I came up with the, 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 one of the first visual influences I had on this book was this um, life-size double-sided collage that I did. Of, it was a self-portrait, which appears in the book a couple times, um, both sides do, that I spent years making out of just like, and I clipped out little pieces like this. This particular one was done in, um, in Procreate, but like the life-size thing was done um, with uh, scissors and magazines and stuff. And it was just like me, I represented myself full of flowers and it was called Life and Death or Love and Death. I can't remember. Anyway, this giant life-size collage um, never saw the light of day. Um, it, it got to a gallery and they accidentally destroyed it. Oh no. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like Ugh. it was it was so painful. <laughs> like, I'm feeling pain right now. <laughs> it was really it was probably around the size of this table, but like a little wider. And um, yeah, no, I cried many tears over it. It ultimately it was fine. Um, it was like a community gallery, and they didn't they had insurance, but not on it because it wasn't on the floor when they destroyed it. It was in the so they're like, okay, well, we'll pay you the $40,000, which I didn't expect. You, know, you, you price it when you don't want to sell it. You price it like it's not going to sell. And, and they're like, we'll pay you the $40,000. I'm like, I cannot take $40,000 from a community space. So we did a trade, and I actually threw my sister her 30th birthday party there. And also I curated a big art show and, and had that there, and, and it was fine. But I still, I still really am sad about this. Um, but so visually... I wanted to pay tribute to this thing that I spent a lot of time and thought on. Um, and so that, that was one of the basis is, bases, bases of um, the visuals. I, I don't know, there's yeah. so much went into this that like every single image was a photo that I either, either took from my photo albums or else I took myself or something that I drew. And, um, and it, on every single page, I could tell you exactly why I made the decision I did that was so very, very specific. As opposed to a lot of times, like when you're painting or making collage, you're just like, oh, I'm gonna put this together like a little puzzle, but it was a puzzle, but it was like a very meaningful puzzle for me. Anyway, long you story kinda... short, I didn't expect anyone to see this and now <laughs> everyone's hopefully gonna see this and then, um, yeah. and it's very personal. Please don't write any bad reviews on Goodreads about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's kind of like you're rebuilding this like archive of your life 
And I'm kind of wondering if like those, because I struggle with that issue of memory. I'm like, when I try to write about my own life, I'm like, am I going to remember everything? <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> no. I'm just so like anxious about that. And there's this like visual trope throughout the book of people whose faces are kind of like modified or erased or even in that um, the first page that I showed here, um, this like face full of flowers. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering if that those like gaps in memory or that struggle that you're having with your memory was one of the reasons why you didn't choose to draw the entire book or, and, and you chose to go with collage and integrating all these other media into the book. That's a really beautiful theory, but no. Okay, <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> um, although the way um, there are certain memories that I draw again and again, like that you saw before, where um, I was drawing them all freehand, kind of to express that my memories keep changing, and like, but like I, it, it, they kept changing. But I was really, really trying to get to the truth of it. Um, and as we know, memoir is not necessarily true. That's autobiography. Like mm. I'm like this is all just my memory, and I'm trying to be as truthful as possible. But like I'm just reaching for the truth the whole time. Mm -hmm. And the truth is amorphous. Like you know what is true right now is not going to be true in five minutes. Like what you know the conversation we had earlier on the park bench. Like we're going to remember it completely differently, both of us. Yeah. And then. A week from now, we're both going to remember it differently again if, if we even think about it. Like, it's, it's just going to constantly be changing. Um, so so how do you get to the truth of that unless right. you have a recording? Um, and, yeah, it's very complicated. But the reason that I had flowers, um, the roses in this um, represent my love uh, for my friend, usually, but also just in general. And when I trust her and love her, like, the roses are in my face or body. And as I as the love starts leaving, they they leave my body. The red here represents, um, well, betrayal. <laughs> um, yeah, everything has a different meaning. Um, but yeah, it's God memory. Yeah, so this book is about friendship, but it's also about just memory and how it's, it's so fucked up. Um, at the same time, I was drawing another uh, book that was sci-fi that I think my agent's pitching currently, and it was about time travel and Alzheimer's and memory. So I was writing two books about memory at the same time, mm -hmm. um, and just, I don't know, it's, it's something that I think about a lot. Yeah. Do you often work on projects simultaneously, mm -hmm. or is it, how does that... I need a break sometimes, yeah. like especially with this this stuff. This was hard because, yeah. like, I'm like, this is something that I've been angry about. I, you know, I was trying, you know, I was so pissed off at her, and just hurt. But also, I still loved her. I still love her. Like, there's all this stuff going on, and like, to just to spend, you know, ten hours a day or more thinking about this and making art and looking pic at pictures of her. Like, I was just getting so angry and sad. I needed something else to just like go to. Like yeah. I can't just focus on that. Um, I don't think it's ultimately a angry, awful book, but I was trying to keep myself in check and not like be, you know, demonizing. It's really hard. Yeah, you know? not being vengeful. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I absolutely did not like. I felt like I was ready to write about her without just and to paint her like a human and mm. not and, and that's why I thought I was ready but then I couldn't remember hu her humanity was the problem mm. um, but yeah I usually I usually have a, a few projects because yeah also when you get stuck on a project it's so helpful to have another project to go to and then I'm like okay well, we'll go back you're usually not maybe not unstuck but you're not as stuck so do you think that the two projects you were working on in this case do you were they talking to each other at all? A little bit. Like, yeah. They always are. Like everything yeah. always is. Like when I was working on Dragon's Breath and other true stories, I was also working on um, this webcomic called Said While Talking, which turned into a zine um, for this place called Tapastic. Um, and they were just like funny things that I have like overheard or that my partner said or whatever, just like silly moments from throughout my life, like like this one time I was dating a vegan who wouldn't go down on me and he said, it, um, I'm like, why not? And he's like, oh, because it doesn't feel very vegan. 
<laughs> I never heard that one. <laughs> so, like, it's not really book worthy, but it's like I really wanted people to know this story. <laughs> and so like I'm writing about my alcoholic, abusive, like racist grandpa, and then I'm like, okay, I need to I need some levity, you yeah. know? And so yeah, they're talking to each other, but you never know it. <laughs> yeah. I kind of love that though. <laughs> um all right. I I have more questions, but I want to make sure if anyone in the audience has questions that you all get a chance. So does anyone have a question? Can I just say something about the vegan story? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, that really sucked when he said it, and I was super pissed. Um, but um, that up to that point, and I've since been paid more, but up to that point, like I ended up winning some kind of, I don't know, a contest with that comic because of how many clicks it got. Um, <laughs> So like I made over a thousand dollars on a comic, so like I was repaid for that shit. <laughs> Good, Happy as ending. you should be. <laughs> um, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I will. Okay, so um, the first thing I wanted to say was I love how your Goodreads, like you always give yourself five stars and say I made this book. I hope you like it. That's funny. And then my other question was, with this book, what are the what are the odds that this person is going to see this book? Oh, she's already seen okay. this book. Oh, she has. So what are the odds that the person is going to see this? Yeah, my, my um, generally now when I write intimately about a person, um, I will show them, I'll give them a warning before it comes out. Um, and, I, and it was really important to me to get her consent to write about a lot of things. Like I divulge a lot of secrets about her in this book. And I wanted it to be OK. So as I was writing about it, I did say, look. <laughs> So, so the question is, um, did this book help rekindle the friendship that it's about or kind of heal that? Um, I would love to answer your question in a, in a better way, but I would like you to read the book and find out. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why we need to donate to the crowdfunder <laughs> that Field Moss Press is running. Sorry, I know that's not a very satisfactory answer. <laughs> Other questions? But it's complicated. <laughs> Yeah, Kayla. I have a kind of silly question. Because we were talking about like the music gel pens early on. You know, they're like ten people using gel pens <sighs> and spilling over. I thought it was people wanted to know what your relationship to gel pens looks like right now. And then they factor that all into the book that you're about. So the question is, what is your relationship to gel pens now? <laughs> and are gel pens going to be featured at all in the new book? There are gel pens in this book, yes. <laughs> Although it's not something that I use when I'm trying to have a very control freaky uh, image. It's, it's usually me messing around. But a lot of this book is just me messing around trying to get the right thing. So I think there's a couple pages where you see, I mean, I know there's at least one page that I have gel pens on that also contains color pencils, which are equally difficult to work with. <laughs> You talking about gel pens is reminding me that when I was in like middle school, they banned gel pens at what? my school. Yeah, because the everyone would fuck? turn their homework in in gel pen and they were like, these are illegal on school grounds. <laughs> why are kids police so much? Why don't anyone why, why doesn't anyone want kids to have fun? Like that's horrible. Yeah, oh. I had a secret stash of gel pens. Oh and my god. This began my illegal activities. <laughs> Oh my gosh! Oh, that makes me—it makes me so mad. Like, I mean, just how they treat teenagers. Yeah, and, it's like it's a gel pen. And kids, my God. Yeah. There was a question back there. Yeah. <laughs> the question is: Have you ever considered making a gel pen zine? Which I, sounds arduous. I don't think so. <laughs> 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 I, I mean, the best thing about tools is like you, you use them for when you want to. And I feel like gel pens have a very specific use in my life, which is um, to do minor details here and there. But like, I think I would go crazy if I did a whole drawing in gel pen, which is really, you have to press down really hard. And I'm, I'm almost 50 and like my, my hands like that, you know, I've been drawing for a very long time. It's rough. Um, yeah, all the way in the back. Um, 
Oh, yes. So the question is about um, you give a warning to your subjects when you're writing and drawing about them. And has anyone ever reacted poorly um, <laughs> to seeing themselves represented? Or am I getting like the gist of the? OK. How much time do I have to answer this? Because I have some good <laughs> stories. I mean, we have. We have okay. four minutes. So. Four minutes. Okay. Um, <laughs> let's see. In Kiss and Tell, there was a football player who um, used to kiss me every day, and then one day I didn't want him to kiss me, and I thought it was a really cute story, and it was just like this, like, I think he wanted to go further, and I said, eh, no, and then we just started kissing each other on the cheek again, and um, I showed that, I hunted him down on, like, Friendster at the time, and I thought he would think it was cute and be flattered, and he was like... Oh my God, I can't believe I treated you so badly. I'm like, what? No, this is a cute story. You should see the other stories in this book. Um, there was this story I did of a um, this woman that I was a horrible date for. Um, we kept trying to make dates, and I didn't agree to go on a date until she said her roommate got a puppy. Um, <laughs> and the whole date, I just ignored her um, and played with her puppy. And then she's like, oh, you're ignoring me. I'm like, oh, OK. And she, she was a prison warden, by the way, which I like that. You know. Anyway, it's kind of hot. Um, and so she's like, oh, you're ignoring me. I'm like, oh, sorry. And then we started fooling around. And then her puppy was like, and it wasn't even her puppy. I ignored her freaking dog. But her, her roommate's puppy, which was a tiny black pug puppy. Oh, that, I have a black pug. Oh, my god. His it's, name's Wallace. Oh, my God. <laughs> Started, like, tugging at my pants because he, he was jealous that we were doing stuff. And then I ignored her for the rest of the time. <laughs> I was the worst date ever. And I showed it to her. And it was, like, 15 years later. And I thought, uh, and she's like, oh, my God, I can't believe you wrote about me. This is the best thing ever. I'm like, oh, OK. <laughs> and then there was a gal that I dated for, like, a year. And we had this, like, it was it was a very strange relationship. And anyway, the first time she told me she loved me, I laughed at her. I'm a terrible person, and I like to write about it. Um, and so many, many years later, I made this comic. And I really, I really didn't want to show it to her. Um, but I talked to a memoir. And like, we're friends on Facebook. And I think I talked to another writer, it was Steve Elliott, um, who ran the Rumpus at the time. And I'm like, what are the chances she's going to see this? She's, and he's like, well, do you have friends in common? I'm like, yes. And she's like, she's going to see it. So how do you want her to see it first, you know, with your consent or without? I'm like, OK, fine. So and it actually involved a third woman who we were in a threesome with. So I ended up emailing both of them and saying, I mean, this is why I laughed, because we were like having sex for the first time. And it was in a threesome. And then she said she loved me. I'm like, that's not how you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> that was really good um, because, well, she clearly was like not happy about that still <laughs> for good reason. And I, you know, I was very apologetic. I'm like, I wrote, wrote this comic. And, I, you know, obviously I'm not the good guy in my comic. Like I was like, here's me being a shithead. Um, and she had some issues from, you know, left over for many years before. And we kind of talked them out for the first time. We never did that. We just kind of not ghosted each other, but we just stopped seeing each other. Um, and... I thought that was really good, and then but she was like, "Oh yeah, you did da, 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 did this and that," and I'm like, "Oh well, yeah, I was you know a little wary of you because you were constantly like hooking up with my friends," and she's like, "No, I didn't," and then I started listing times, and then she kind of stopped emailing me, <laughs> but it's fine, and we're friendly now, and but like we clearly you know it was, a, it was an opportunity to open up, but like that's the thing, I never know how it's gonna go. It's really stressful, <laughs> but like it's also kind of rewarding because it like kind of gives you closure, sort of. Even when they're a butthead about it, it gives you closure because you're like, oh, okay, good. I know this about you now. Mm -hmm. Like, and I feel like life is like that. Like, the more sh sometimes shitty experiences are great to have because you. It's good to find out someone's a shithead so you can kind of move on from them. You know. Or it can be good to find out that you're a shithead. Oh, so yes. I mean, <laughs> ultimately, we're all shitheads. <laughs> and, you know, we just have to own it and apologize and move on and try to stop being shitheads when we recognize it about ourselves. And, like, here's the thing about writing autobio. Sometimes you don't even know that you were a shithead until you write about it. And you're just like, oh, man, what? whoa. <laughs> Did I really laugh at her when she said, oh, God. I mean, it made sense to me at the time because I'm like, what a funny time to say I love you, but like, mm, no, you don't do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I did. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, Mari, this has been really fun to Yay. talk to you. Um, <laughs> are you signing today? Yes, I don't know where someone's going to whisk me away. Um, are, you're signing right after this? Yes. Okay, yes. so you can see them on the floor signing. Go check out the Field Mouse Press table to see Mari's new book. Donate to the crowdfunder. And there's a little QR code where you could donate to it, please. Yes. <laughs> and then tonight, um, we'll be chatting about queer banned books. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah so that'll be the, the girl was banned in Katy, Texas. Yes. So we'll be chatting with a couple <laughs> other artists at um, CCAD tonight. To, Maya Kobabe and Chong Lin Nguyen. Yes. right there <laughs> next to my publisher alexander hoffman <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um thanks everyone and thanks mari thanks for coming <laughs> Yay. thanks rachel <laughs>